kick off our event tonight, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming to our 2000s Decade panel, which is happening in conjunction with the museum's Art at Hendrix exhibition. Uh, the exhibition is currently available to view online on the museum's website, which is wingatemuseum.org. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, my name is Rebecca Jolly, and I'm a student working in curatorial research. I'm also a senior at Hendrix, um, and I'll be co-moderating the, the panel tonight the wonderful Hannah Samuel, who is a sophomore at Hendricks and a museum associate in education. Um, and while the two of us are hosting this evening's panel virtually, we want to acknowledge that the Wingate Museum of Art at Hendricks College occupies the traditional homelands of the Osage, Quapa, and Caddo. Um, we offer our respect and gratitude to the indigenous peoples who have cared for the land over generations. Um, so now we'll move on to introducing our three panelists. And as we do, we ask that you please keep yourself muted to avoid distractions and disruptions. But if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. And so Hannah, I'll let you introduce our first panelist. Good evening, everyone. Our first panelist is Jennifer Carmen. Jennifer Carmen graduated from Hendricks College in 2000. She holds a master's degree in art history from the University of Glasgow with an emphasis on fine and decorative American and European arts and as a graduate connoisseur of Christie's education in London. She has a certificate in appraisal studies from the State University of New York and is an accredited senior appraiser of fine art. Since 2003, she has worked as a private art advisor serving a national clientele of private collectors, commercial galleries, insurance companies, and museum professionals from her office in downtown Little Rock. She is co-author of Historic Arkansas Museum's Arkansas Made publication, which chronicles over 1,000 artists and artisans who worked in Arkansas through 1950. The book comes out any day now, by the way. So, thank you, Jennifer, for joining us tonight. Um, and I'm going to introduce our next panelist, uh, who is Laura Allen. Uh, Laura is the executive director of the South Arkansas Art Center in El Dorado. She came to the arts administration world a little over three years ago, and until then was working primarily as a writer and editor. Um, a native of Jonesboro, she graduated from Hendrix in 2001 with a degree in English. Uh, she worked for the statewide publication at home in Arkansas for nine years before relocating to El Dorado. Uh, there she worked with the Diamond Agency to launch and edit two quarterly publications, which are Cloud9 and the El Dorado Insider. In 2014, after many years as an SAAC committee member, volunteer, and Arts Academy parent, she came to the center as executive director. She and her husband, Sam, have two daughters, Harper, who is 11, and Rosie, who is six. So thank you, Laura, for joining us tonight. Our next panelist is Carrie Voss. Carrie Voss is a Conway native and fifth generation Arkansan. She is curator of exhibits at Historic Arkansas Museum in Little Rock, where she has worked in several different capacities for over seven years. Carrie earned a bachelor's in fine art from Hendricks in 2002 and a master's in fine art and painting from American University in Washington, DC in 2005, and identifies as an artist, educator, curator, and creative problem solver. Voss lives in the Capitol View neighborhood of Little Rock with her husband, Ben Jones, who is class of 2002 and master's degree in 2003 of Hendrix, and two cats who are not yet eligible to apply to Hendrix. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, and thanks to all of our panelists for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the first question. So the Art at Hendrix exhibition centers around Hendrix, as you can probably tell by the title. Um, and specifically looks at the diverse artistic practices that come out of it. So we wanted to start this panel by asking each of you about your time at Hendrix. So I'd love to hear what about your Hendrix experience stands out to you most, whether that's a particular class or a particular professor or, or something more broad. So uh, Jennifer, if we could start with you, that'd be great. Uh, sure. So when I think back to my time at Hendrix, uh, you know, the art department specifically was very much kind of uh, it managed by Don Marr, who had been there for many years. And my senior year was his last year there. And I still, 20 years later, remember like it was yesterday, his Italian Renaissance art history class. And also that my senior year was the first year that Rod Miller was there. And he, I recall clearly some very lively discussion in one of his art history classes about whether a bad guy like Caravaggio can make good art. And that has stayed with me quite a while. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Laura, do you wanna go next? Um, sure, I think really what 
one of the things that stands out to me about my time at Hendrix is just what I learned about building a community, you know, making connections with people who share interests and who share values and who share um, just like a, a curiosity. And that's really what I try to do in the arts now is I try to build a community. I'm not an artist, I'm an administrator. So what my job is, is to build that community. And I think a lot of that comes from what I learned at Hendrix. And then Carrie, I'll throw it over to you now. Sure, you know, it's really fascinating to hear even from Jennifer, um, who's not too far ahead of me in terms of, uh, of class at Hendrix. Um, how different uh, her experience was um, from mine. Uh, I was beginning art at Hendrix as Don Mar was leaving. And, um, you know, uh, my experience uh, in the Hendrix art department um, revolved so much around um, the community of fellow studio art majors um, in Trishman and the, that tiny weird space that we shared together um, and uh, the coming of uh, Matthew Lopas, who uh, replaced um, Don Morris, the primary uh, painting and drawing instructor, and, um, and, and how much um, Matt Lopas's influence as an instructor um, guided me as a young artist. Um, but, um, but definitely what was most important to me and what um, really still means a lot to me was um, the the friendships and the um, you know the lively artistic discussions that happened late night in the studio and in Trishman as we squished together in our little communal space. That's awesome. Thank you all for sharing. We were also curious about what kind of steps you took after you graduated Hendrix. I know that some of you went to, I think all of you went to master's programs. Um, how did you choose those? Um, did you choose to stay in the state or go out? And why did you do that? And we can start with Jennifer. When I graduated from Hendrix, I didn't exactly have a plan apart from the fact that I knew I really wanted to work in a field of art. And I had lots of ideas of what that might look like. And in the end, I actually moved to London with several friends from Hendrix, um, most of whom were art majors with me. And we lived in a flat for a while and worked strange jobs and tried to navigate life and all sort of made our ways in different ways during that time. I eventually was accepted into a grad school program that would be a mix of traditional art history and more hands-on connoisseurship um, at Christie's Auction House. And that enabled me to stay there for several years, which was really marvelous years. I think of those years as fondly as my Hendrix years, just in different ways. And that training occurred overseas. And I, I think in the United Kingdom, there's a stronger emphasis on vocational training. And so master's programs there are more likely to address when the rubber hits the road and how you can apply this knowledge to making a living and how you can develop skills that are in demand. And I think that that was a really wise thing for me to do, even though at the time I did it, I had no idea of that difference, but it certainly appealed to me. And I think in the end was, was quite important to my development. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's really interesting. Um, Laura, if you'd like to speak on this. Sure. I think um, my immediate professional development is really a testament to two things at Hendrix. And one of them is the career services department, which helped me immensely and my advisor, uh, Dr. Alice Hines. So I knew that I wanted to work in the writing and editing space, and I didn't exactly know what that was going to look like. So Dr. Hines told me I needed to get an internship and uh, career services helped me. And I did two internships and the first one I hated 
and I'm not going to tell you all where it was, but it was not in um, journalism. It was in uh, publishing. And I learned so much from doing an internship that I absolutely despised that um, my next internship, which was at, at Home in Arkansas Magazine, I loved. And I knew very quickly that this was the right space for me to be in. And Dr. Hines told me that I better make myself irreplaceable, and I did. So I was 20 years old, and it was a very small operation. And I just got in there, and I started working. And I got a lot of experience very quickly working in a small shop. There were not very many of us. And I had friends who were going all over the world, working for publications, working for newspapers. And they might write one thing a month. And I had to write dozens of things. Like I just had to write and write and write and write. And that really um, sort of sharpened my focus. And I figured out I could do just about anything at a magazine. And um, then after I'd been there for nine years, moved to El Dorado, and I was able to create two magazines basically from scratch. And strangely, all those skills really translated well into an arts administration space. You know, the, the organizing and the communicating and the, the thinking and the planning um, translated very well. So it really all started in Dr. Hines's office and uh, I have a lot to thank her for. Thank you. I think we all have a lot to thank for the career services department. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, uh, Carrie, would you like to speak on this question? Sure thing. Um, <clears throat> similar to Jennifer, um, I came out of Hendrix um, knowing that I wanted to be in the arts. I wanted, I mean, at the time I felt very passionately that I wanted to be a painter. Um, I wanted to teach at the collegiate level and, um, and I knew that if I wanted to do that, I needed to go to graduate school. Um, but um, Immediately after Hendrix, there was definitely a period of, um, you know, I had my fair share of uh, confusion and floundering, um, uh, like a, a lot of folks do. And um, I thought at the time that, you know, you really couldn't um, be successful in the arts if you stayed in Arkansas. And um, I drug fellow um, studio mate. Vanessa Norton McEwen um, to New York City, um, which she was, she was happy to do. And we shared a teeny little apartment in the East Village. And um, I attended um, the New York Studio School and studied drawing, drawing and painting at eight to five, five days a week um, and, um, and loved it. And simultaneously was, um, financially and emotionally exhausted from um, living in New York. And so I came back to Conway. Um, and around the same time I had applied for and been accepted to a graduate um, painting program at American University in DC, um, where the famous painter Stanley Lewis um, was teaching. And, um, and I imagined studying with Stanley, um, but I was also, really unsure about um, making that move and taking on um, significant student loan debt. Um, and uh, so with um, the encouragement of Matt Lopas, I uh, went ahead and made that leap and was really glad that I did. Although, um, you know, as, as things would work out, um, Stanley Lewis retired, right? Like the year before I um, attended AU and so, I didn't get to study with Stanley, um, but um, it was nevertheless like a, a really challenging and um, incredible experience. And um, it forced me to think about my own art, artistic practice um, outside of uh, the kind of um, bounds of traditional painting. Um, and so um, I'm really, glad that I um, that I made that decision and and went ahead and um, went to DC and um, came back to Arkansas uh, yet again. Um, and I've always felt like, you know, 
um, high quality education is the best investment that you can make in yourself. And, um, and despite, you know, some student loan debt, uh, I think that investment has paid dividends um, ever since, so. Thank you all for, for sharing. Um, I'd love to talk now about uh, the organizations that you all currently work for. Um, so if you could tell me a little bit about those organizations, uh, Jake Carmen Inc., uh, Art Center, um, uh, and then how you came to work there. I'd love to hear about that. So Jennifer, uh, let's start with you. So when I came back from my time at Christie's, I was trying to cobble together enough jobs to have a stab at being self-employed. And I was sending my resume to museums and I was actually getting a lot of work cataloging collections for state agencies. And the thing I realized is that everywhere I went, people, when they heard I had been trained at Christie's, they wanted me to do appraisals. And I realized that that really required additional training beyond my years at Christie's. And so I, I sort of embarked on that course of training with appraisal theory and methodology, while at the same time trying to juggle an array of interesting art jobs, ranging from cataloging collections to stenciling ceilings of historic buildings with a, a decorative painter named Becky Witzel that some people may know. And I used a variety of skills. I did restoration of statues and just you name it, I did it. I had also worked at a commercial gallery in London, uh, one of the oldest galleries in London for a period before I came back. Uh, and eventually as I got the training and as these jobs that I was cobbling together started to really amount to something, I decided to incorporate myself. So I suppose my business is turning 16 this year from the date that I incorporated, but really I've been plugging away at it for probably 18 years now. And uh, my company is called J. Carmen Inc. And I am a fine art advisor. I have a lot of clients that hire me to not only catalog collections, but sometimes provide appraisals for insurance or uh, tax purposes or estate planning. And often that research overlaps with other interesting art research like provenance research or authentication or other, other art advisory services that may have to do with buying or selling or advice in general. And so that's my, that's my business and I hope to do that till I can't work anymore because I love it. That's great to hear. Uh, Lori, do you wanna talk about the Art Center? Sure. Um, I think to understand the South Arkansas Art Center, you have to really understand the place it exists in El Dorado. It is not just a place that you would go to see art or to see a show. It is really like a community center. And my job is basically to connect all, all the people together. So I work to connect artists with students and I work to connect artists with an audience and I work to connect artists with patrons and um, all of those people together in a big, beautiful sort of soup. We have um, a community theater and we, in non-COVID times, we do about three adult shows and three children's shows a year. We have three gallery spaces and have um, local emerging sort of regional artists coming through every month. And then we have um, a very, very busy after school arts academy. So we have classes for basically from four years old and up in ballet, music, piano lessons, voice lessons, visual art, graphic art, movie making. Um, if you can think of it, if you want to do a class, I will make a class for you. So we do a little bit of everything. And then we also have um, some weekend workshops and um, limited run classes for adults. I find that adults do not want to sign up for a whole semester of classes, but they will do three days in a row or they will do five weeks in a row and that's about it. And right now some of those are on Zoom and some of those are in person and some of those are in all different formations all the time. 
And then the other way that we connect artists to the community is through a program called Arts and Education that is grant funded by the Arkansas Arts Council. And so I get a grant every year, which is then matched by fundraising dollars to send artists into the public school classroom. And it's just a very important part of our mission because we try to reach every student in the public school system at least once with an art intensive residency at some point during their career. So we have about five artists at any given time and not all visual artists, um, actors, musicians, all sorts of things who work directly with classroom teachers to do residencies that in some way support their classroom curriculum. So they might be doing a unit on architecture and an artist will come in and they will build skyscraper models together. There's a, a million different ways that they can work with those teachers, but it also serves to sort of create a community in El Dorado where every single kid knows a full-time working artist. Nobody has never met an artist. Nobody's never talked to an artist. Like, they see artists all the time. They work with artists. They see them at the grocery store. And um, they really have become a part of their lives and a part of our town, which is about 18,000 people. So those connections, those, those bridges get really small when um, you are introducing people to the arts at an early age and then reinforcing it over and over and over throughout their lives. So not only is the Art Center just a really fun place to come, on a Saturday and come to a reception and have a glass of wine and see some art or come and see a show or come and take a class. It is really um, a, an overarching community and sort of community-wide respect for the arts and appreciation for the arts. And I had lived in El Dorado about, I don't remember how long, maybe five years before I came to work here. And uh, I, I was always at the Art Center. The first time I ever came to El Dorado to meet my husband's parents, we came to see me in St. Louis at the Art Center. So it's a gathering place and we just love to suck people in and we love to get new people and we get excited when they're strangers. We're like, ooh, strangers. But um, it's a really important place to our town and it is, um, it, it is something that only grows, so. Thank you for that, Laura. It sounds like you guys are doing really important work. Um, Carrie, I'd love to hear more about the Historic Arkansas Museum and how you came to work there. Sure. Um, so Historic Arkansas Museum, for those of you all who are um, not familiar, is um, a both an, his, an historic site in downtown Little Rock um, that has um, several of the oldest remaining structures in the city of Little Rock um, going back to around 1827. Um, and um, also, a, a, you know, a great museum with eight galleries, uh, over 6,000 square feet of um, galleries that show contemporary Arkansas art and objects. And also um, that we pull from uh, the collection of Historic Arkansas Museum, which encompasses um, decorative, fine, and mechanical arts um, made by and used by Arkansans from um, prehistory, uh, but primarily focusing on uh, around 1819, uh, the founding of the Arkansas Territory through around 1950. Um, although we do have two uh, galleries dedicated to contemporary Arkansas artists and artisans. Um, and uh, so a lot of you, well, uh, if there are older folks in the audience may remember um, going to the Arkansas Territorial Restoration as, as kids and seeing those wonderful um, historic homes. Um, but uh, in uh, 2000, 2001, um, the new museum center was built, and um, so uh, my responsibility as curator of exhibits at HAM is to um, program and produce um, the content for those um, eight galleries. And um, so since we do 
both historic um, objects and contemporary uh, exhibitions. Um, we do, especially pre-COVID, you know, things have obviously changed quite a lot in the past year, but um, we would rotate um, anywhere between 19 and 27 exhibits a year, um, small scale one day pop-ups um, to exhibits that were years in the making. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, when I came out of Hendrix, um, I said, you know, my dream was to be a um, full-time professor at a collegiate institution and a painter. And um, I did start out um, my art career after graduate school um, doing uh, full-time um, teaching at uh, UCA and um, also UACCM. Um, but I, I found that that was really not something that was sustainable for me um, long-term. There was just a tremendous amount of competition um, from other working artists and I wasn't able to find um, a tenure track position. Um, and uh, so uh, I realized that, you know, like a lot of us who work in the arts, um, if you really want a position in the arts and you want to work in the arts for the rest of your life, you have to be willing to adapt. Um, and so I took, um, you know, what I already knew and did as um, an artist and an educator. And um, I began working first full, uh, part-time actually as um, assistant curator of exhibits at, uh, at HAM and um, learned through my colleagues, people like Jen Carmen um, and uh, my uh, boss Donna Updegrove, um, a lot of hands-on knowledge and um, in the process over the past seven years or so, I feel like I've added maybe two or three unofficial degrees um, just through uh, experience and, and um, learning on my own. Um, but, you know, I think um, certainly whenever I was younger, I thought that um, the path to success was kind of like an orderly, like, you know, you make a little step here and then a little step here and a little step here and a little step here and a little step here. And, you know, you basically go from here to here in a straight line to like success up here at the top. Um, but what I've realized in real life is that um, it looks more like maybe a tangled ball of string or a winding river or like, you know, a road that goes like this. Um, and that sometimes wherever you end up, um, wherever you are, that maybe looks like success to other people you had no idea that you were gonna end up there. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, um, that's really been my um, main lesson in life um, working in the arts is um, you gotta hold on and, um, and adapt uh, to whatever opportunities present your, uh, are presented to you and, um, so I'm, I'm really delighted to be the person who um, is responsible for um, programming exhibits at uh, HAM, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. We're also curious to see what a typical day looks like in each of your careers. So like what you do from nine to five, you know, um, how I know all of you do something different, but if you'd like to start out, Jennifer, that'd be great. The best thing about my career is that there's truly no such thing as a typical day because no two days can be alike because the objects and clients and assignments are always different. Some days I'm inspecting objects, going to people's homes or to museums to scrutinize objects or touch them or photograph them. Other days are more research oriented. So that may mean culling through auction results or interviewing gallerists and private dealers. It could mean that I am working with a person to authenticate a work of art or 
figuring out if I can get someone's object into a catalog resume that's being developed. And I would say that my favorite days are the days where I am interfacing with objects and the people who love them because I feel like I have sort of a, a front row seat to my own kind of private movie and no one else is getting to see this thing or hear the story with it. And it's really such a privilege and an honor and I enjoy it so much. Yesterday I was uh, cataloging a large collection of regional artworks from out of the state. And tomorrow morning I'm going to see a Charles Russell painting that has never been out of the family's possession. And I don't know what other career I could have that would give me such diversity and interest and in how I spend my time and the rabbit holes I get to jump down. So I would say those are those are all the things that make my work so fun. I sort of I feel like I'm getting away with something. That's so awesome. Uh, Laura, what does a typical day look like for you? Uh, yeah, I, I wanna echo what Jennifer said. Like I don't have a typical day. I, I wear a lot of different hats as anybody at a small nonprofit does. We have um, five full-time employees and um, one of them is entirely devoted to our building. So we all do a lot of, a lot of different things. Um, a lot of what I do is logistics and planning and I do a lot of grant writing and fundraising um, there if you don't have the money you can't do the programming and that is really our our principle we are going to be sure that we have the money before we do the programming and um, that's a lot of what has kept us afloat during COVID because um, if you can't have a summer musical where you can sell lots of tickets and bring in lots of revenue, you have to be sure that you're making your money or not spending your money elsewhere. So yes, I spend a lot of time worrying about money, obviously. And um, I also spend a lot of time planning the calendar. We have a very, very busy building and we have a stage and we have three galleries and we have all these classrooms. And you would think that there'd be plenty of time to do everything, but there's not. I have like I have a color coding system of who is using what room when and how long they're gonna be there. And it's always getting messed up and wrong. So I do a lot of that, but that is my mission. I am making it easier for artists to do what they love to do. You know, if artists, if you wanna teach a class and then you have to figure out how to get a classroom and then you have to figure out how to get students and then you have to figure out how to take their money. And then like, it's just very overwhelming. So what I do is I just smooth out all those edges for all, all of my creative friends to come and do what they really are passionate about in our building. So um, a lot of time I spend talking to people, which is um, the gift of my life. Like people walk in all day long and I get to talk to them and they you never know where they're from and you don't know if it's gonna be somebody that you've known your whole life or a completely new person. And it's my job to make them feel welcome and to make them know that the arts is a, is a wonderful, and the Arts Center is a wonderful inclusive place where everyone can come in El Dorado and, and find people to become a community with. So I don't know that that's really a very clear description of what my day is like. I also spend a lot of time getting kids in and out of the building and making sure they go to the bathroom and keeping people from getting nosebleeds and, Many hats, many, many hats. Thank you so much for sharing. Carrie, if you'd like to go. Sure. Um, I will echo Jennifer and Laura and say that um, one of my favorite things about uh, working as a curator of exhibits at HAM, and, you know, like Laura mentioned, um, at a small to medium sized institution. Um, you do a lot of things. And I think that's one of the things that has been wonderful for me in terms of um, my ability to learn a lot of new things is that, you know, if I worked at an institution like Crystal Bridges, um, you know, I would have a lot less autonomy 
um, a lot less opportunity to do a variety of things. And, um, you know, so as it is, um, I'm one person who has a really big job in terms of um, there's just a lot of stuff to do and that has to be done. Um, and um, so um, I really don't have a typical day either, um, especially in a non-COVID environment. Um, a big portion of my time is um, always uh, looking at objects in the ham collection, um, researching and thinking about those objects, interpreting those objects, um, and uh, working with my fantastic colleagues, um, primarily Victoria Garrett Chandler, who is Hendrix 12, um, and, um, and our, our small staff, um, to program content for um, all of the galleries. And um, so I do a lot of that, but I also get to flex my creative muscles almost every day. Um, you know, there's, you know, you have to select the objects um, for, you know, thematize objects for um, an exhibition. Um, but you also have to design the user experience and, you know, what is it going to look like and how is it going to feel and what are you going to encounter first and, um, you know, kind of how do you, how do you tell a story um, with objects and um, so um, I get to do that. Um, I also, um, you know, kind of uh, like Laura said, getting children in to use the bathroom and make sure they don't have nosebleeds. And my, my version of that is um, I move and clean a lot of stuff. Um, I get to handle objects all the time, which um, I absolutely adore. Um, I think like Jennifer, one of my favorite things about my job is um, that I get to look at an object that has been collected and I know that it has value, but then I look into um, who owned it and who made it and how is it used and, um, you know, how did it come into our collection? And I get to do research and write um, in such a way that um, brings humanity back to an object that gives life to something that is um, that, that otherwise is, is just a thing. Um, and so I love that as well, but, um, but, you know, it's, um, there's a little bit of everything in every day. And, um, you know, sometimes I'm, um, picking up dead roaches and scrubbing spider poop out from underneath a 150 year old wardrobe. Um, and other days I get to talk to contemporary artists and um, book folks for our two contemporary galleries and hear about what they're working on and um, the materials they're using and um, really sort of revel in um, what is honestly an amazing um, artistic community in, in Arkansas that I, I didn't know existed um, in the way that it really does uh, before I worked at HAM. So now we have a couple questions that are specifically tailored towards each of you. So uh, we have two questions for you, Jennifer, two for you, Laura, and two for Carrie. Um, so I'm going to start with our questions for Jennifer. Um, and it's interesting, Carrie, that you just mentioned the um, arts community in Arkansas, because that's actually what our question is about. Um, so something we've heard a lot doing these panels is the community of Hendrix alums specifically that are actively involved with the arts community in and around Little Rock. Um, last week, Cindy Scott Hughesman mentioned um, that she's worked with you, Jennifer, as part of her, her role of Cantrell Gallery. So um, I'd love to hear about your perspective on, on what it's like to work with other Hendrix alums and to engage with a community in which so many people have a, like a similar background um, with you. It is so wonderful. I regularly have overlapping work with other Hendrix grads, many of whom I know and work with for years before I discover they went to Hendrix. And those people may have galleries. Uh, Greg Thompson is someone I my work overlaps with his. 
Uh, obviously, the, the Scott Huseman family. Um, who else? So many, so many people. Also, my office downtown, which is in a historic house called Mills Davis, I actually um, share office space with Norton Arts, who are a, an art conservation company, and they have deep ties to Hendrix. And so it's really quite extraordinary. And obviously in the museum world, I, I have a lot of overlapping work with Carrie Voss and with Vict Victoria Garrett Chandler at Historic Arkansas Museum. And so it seems there are Hendrix, Hendrix alum everywhere. And I really love the fact that we have this community that's not only grounded in the professional the professionalism that we share and the overlap of the way our specializations might dovetail in some ways, but also it's quite interesting to, to reminisce and hear from one another about their time at Hendrix because even though in this panel there's sort of been this overlap, there's also I think quite different experiences and I certainly being the oldest person on this panel have quite clear memories of Don Marr. And for those of you who weren't on campus for all, all of his years, you know, he, he walked around campus in a leather Stetson and these very crisp blue jeans. And he loved to play Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass in Trishman. And it was just, he, he made sure that everyone who attended Hendrix understood the concept of kitsch and could appreciate kitsch. And he also, he had this beautiful wife, Camilla, and the two of them could really dance together. And at a variety of Hendrix functions, you would sometimes see Don and Camilla off together, you know, clinking their wine glass or having a dance. And anyone who was a student of Don Mars knew how much he enjoyed his family. And I feel like that was kind of a lasting, left a lasting impression, I'm sure, on a lot of students because I think it really drove home the point of uh, the, the importance of making a life, not just a living. And so anyway, I've gone off on some tangent here, but yes, it is so fun to work with a number of people who have that Hendrix tie. Thank you so much for sharing that. We we're also curious about how working on different objects differs from each other. So like working on a house versus working on a painting, uh, what are like the pros and cons? Do you prefer one over the, over the other? How does that process work differently? Well, I would, I do, I am engaged in a lot of historic preservation work that isn't, isn't really my career per se, but what I really like about a house is that it gives the opportunity to be creative. And I think that there's creative expression inherent in that work and then the decisions you're making about the design or the color or the concept or the forms or what, what you're going to do in a space that people are going to spend time in. Whereas my, my appraisal and advisory work is really grounded in absolutes. It's my analysis of data and my interpretation of what I'm observing. And yes, there's maybe a smidge of room to be a little creative in one's interpretation, but generally it's a very objective task. And I feel that a, a ha you know, restoring a house is a little more creative, I would say. Great, thank you, Jennifer, for answering your questions. Um, Laura, I'd love to, to ask you a couple, the first um, being uh, how you find that your English major specifically um, continues to uh, help you, whether it's in your work as an art or uh, with the art center or just more broadly in, in what you do in, in everyday life. I think that um, being an English major taught me how to take a whole lot of information and distill that information down to the parts that I need to use in any given situation. You know, I 
not just reading, but like reading, fiction reading, nonfiction reading, narrative, and figuring out what parts are important to what I'm doing when. Um, uh, you know, at Hendrix, I might have to read 300 pages on a weekend, and then I might need to figure out how to write 300 words about those 300 pages on Monday. So that really um, comes into play um, writing grants, which I do a lot, um, because writing grants are kind of like a puzzle. You know, like there's going to be questions, and they might ask you the same question six different ways, but you have to figure out. You have to take the information that they're giving you, figure out how to answer so that you're not repeating yourself, but you're, and you're also giving them another piece of the pie. So that sort of like information distillation is really what I use. And I write a whole bunch still. Like, I mean, I mean, I write three sentences to describe a class and I write 30 page grant applications. So I write a lot and I read a lot and I process information a lot. So I think that's what I use on the day-to-day -day from my English background. However, I should have taken a class in business math. I would take it now. Thank you. I'm also an English major, so it's nice to Are hear you that. really? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're also curious about what it's like to work on the administration side of an arts industry. Mm -hmm. Um, and how that might differ from other areas and what you appreciate about it and things like that. Sure. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about being an arts administrator is the sheer number of volunteers and board members that I deal with on a daily basis. And that is really what makes our organization so strong and why so many people feel so invested in it. Um, I have a board of directors that has 21 people on it. And then I have a visual arts steering committee committee that has 16 people on it and what that committee does is um, really if if an artist approaches the art center about showing or being involved in some way it goes through that committee first and they have subcommittees and so then the subcommittees um, review it and they make recommendations to their committee and then that committee makes recommendations to me and then I make a recommendation to the big board and then there's also a theater um, a theater art steering committee and they plan a, a season and they um, plan out what's going to be, you know, a straight play or a summer musical or a small musical. And they basically use their volunteer hours to make all of those projects happen. So there are so many people who do so many things to make all the things that we do at the center happen. And I kind of fill in all the little cracks and crevices. You know, I, uh, my predecessor who um, ran the center, Beth Burns, for many, many years, she told me, she said, never volunteer to do anything because there will be something that doesn't get done and that's what you get to do. So whether, whatever that is, whether it's the cockroaches or the nosebleeds or something even more unexpected and interesting, those are all, all the things that I get to do. And I think that's what makes it like interesting and different all the time. Thank you for that. Uh, Carrie, we'd love to end by asking you two questions. Um, first, we'd love to talk about all the work that you and Victoria did assisting us in putting together the Art at Hendrix exhibition, because um, you guys were very, very important to helping us fill out uh, the history from the beginning of, of Hendrix's art department. So I, I'd love to hear about the work that you guys did to, to help us put the show together. Sure. Um, I certainly didn't do as much work as Victoria did um, on the, the early years, but um, I, I was really happy to contribute um, to the exhibition, both as an artist and um, as a, a researcher. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I definitely, um, Victoria and I did uh, research into the early years at, um, the, of the Hendrix Art Department, which, you know, she and I both discussed um, at the beginning of this project how, um, you know, myself as a, you know, as a person who's native to Conway and, um, and both she and I who um, were Hendrix grads um, were really sort of amazed about how little we knew about the history of the Hendrix art department. And so it was, um, it was really fascinating to um, go back and discover um, some of that, although, you know, it, 
institutional history is so is one of those things that you know we felt like we were just like scratching the surface really um and uh uh there's so much more that i mean i, I think probably um art, you know, if there were art historians, uh, majors at Hendrix could write, you know, um, papers upon papers on um, the history of the art department at Hendrix. Um, but um, yeah, I really enjoyed uh, doing research on that and learning more about um, the faculty members and students who, um, who came out of uh, the Hendrix art department before me. And um, uh, mostly, I uh, one of my functions at the museum, um, and in in general, is um, I'm I'm kind of like um, the the general editor, I guess, and so uh, I enjoyed um, getting to help Victoria refine her essay for um, for the early uh, art department um, portion. But um, yeah, I was uh, super excited and um, really appreciative. Uh, of being included and, um, and, and thought of. So yeah, I think you guys did a great job. Thank you so much for helping with the exhibition. We're also curious about what other exhibitions you've been involved in and which has been your favorite and why? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, whenever I saw that um, question, I thought like, wow, you know, it's, um, so I started working at Historic Arkansas Museum and 2013, um, and I have been involved in every single exhibit um, that the museum has put on since then, uh, either as an assistant curator or um, as a lead curator for um, those exhibits. And, and like I said, in 2019, we rotated 27 exhibits that year alone. Um, and so it's really hard to narrow down um, favorites, however, um, as a contemporary artist myself, I will say that um, I am partial to um, the exhibits on, in Trinity and second floor galleries, um, simply because I um, absolutely love talking to other artists about their work. And um, like I mentioned earlier, before I worked at Historic Arkansas Museum, I really didn't understand how many um, world-class artists are from or live in Arkansas. And um, the opportunity to exhibit the objects made by um, contemporary artists and artisans um, is such a thrill. I love it. I can't, I, I can't get enough of it. Um, but, um, but I've also come to really appreciate um, historic objects uh, in the museum's collection. And um, I tend to fall in love, honestly, with whatever project I'm working on at the moment. Um, I think uh, in recent history, um, my two favorite exhibits that I've worked on were um, History and Color, which um, is, is still up through, just through, um, mid-March, we'll start taking it down. And uh, it was in uh, using, <clears throat> pardon me, objects from Ham's collection to explore the function of color in uh, 19th century American objects. Um, and um, we have uh, another major exhibition, uh, Stitched Together, um, which is still on display through August um, that celebrates uh, 10 of the museum's most treasured quilts, um, I believe eight of which are were made prior to 1900. And um, that was a really a huge undertaking um, and especially um, working out how to display those extremely fragile textiles um, uh, and uh, maintain conservation standards for, for those pieces. Um, but um, uh, we're Jessica um, Lenahan, assistant curator, and uh, Victoria Garrett Chandler, who we've mentioned before, um, were in the end phases of um, curating an exhibit called Conspicuous Consumption, um, which will uh, open hopefully in August. Um, and that exhibit focuses on 
uh, the objects that 19th century Arkansans made, bought, and used to stay on trend and in style. Um, and uh, it's really been um, a hoot and a pleasure uh, to work on. So um, anyway, I'm just, uh, just ridiculously lucky um, to have uh, the job that I have at the museum. And I love all of it. Um, one last shout out, um, I couldn't begin to name all of my favorite uh, contemporary artists that I've worked with, but Kinsuke Yamada um, is exhibiting his work both at the Wingate Museum at Hendrix and at um, Historic Arkansas Museum right now, and he is um, an amazing ceramic sculptor, and I hope you guys get an opportunity to check him out. Well, thank you all for answering our questions. Those are all we have, and we appreciate you answering them with such thoughtfulness and such care. Um, we're going to open this up to questions now, so feel free to type those in the chat, and we'll we'll read them out. We do already have one um, from Philip. So uh, he asks, do any of you offer internships for students or serve as mentors for people wanting to go into your various professions? So. Yeah, Laura. I do. Uh, we have, typically we have a high school intern. Um, usually it's a senior and it's sort of a kind of a big deal to get to be the art center intern for your senior year. Um, it is a paid internship and I'm a big believer in internships, obviously, but um, we always are looking for summer interns also. So uh, we've got a lot to do. Jennifer or Carrie, do you have anything that you'd like to, to add? I can say that I have had um, interns before, so it's certainly something I'm open to, but also it's a challenging thing because within the structure of my business, since it is a for-profit business and since a lot of the work is highly confidential, it's not always easy for me to find ways to engage an intern or to have enough things that they could do that is makes it a viable option really. Uh, sometimes I do train people to do certain tasks and hire them to, you know, pay them to help me do a thing that I think is a skill that will be helpful to them on the road to what they want to do. But I don't have a, a formal program in the way that a museum probably would. Um, Historic Arkansas Museum uh, does offer a graduate assistantship program um, in, in non-COVID times anyway. Um, we work with UALR's um, graduate uh, program in public history and uh, typically will engage um, a graduate student assistant um, in an assistantship uh, for two years. Um, and uh, we try to give them opportunities to work um, in all of the departments of the museum, um, focusing on whatever area they're most interested in. So education, curatorial collections, um, all of those things. And, and they're really valuable members of our team. Um, we don't have anyone right now because of, um, you know, because of, uh, concerns about um, COVID, but we're definitely looking forward to um, adding a new graduate assistant whenever we're able to. Great, well, thank you for answering and thank you for your question, Philip. I don't see any more in the chat, so unless someone um, comes in with a, a last minute question, I'll go ahead and uh, wrap this up for everyone. Um, I, I will point you to the chat, though, because Sarah has linked to the online art at Hendrix exhibition, which, of course, we want you to check out. Um, and you can also look at the other exhibitions we have up, like one by Ray Allen Parker um, and Katrina Andre. So they're uh, all great exhibitions, and I, I would highly encourage everyone to go look at them. So I don't see any last-minute questions. So thank you all for coming again, and, and uh, have a great night. Good night, thank everyone. You. Thank you so much for inviting us to do this. It's wonderful.
Thank you so much. This was so me. much fun. It was very exciting. Thanks for all I wish I could time. see all the same place. <laughs>